is Freak Media. Thanks for joining us uh, today as we take a keen look into some of the issues and events happening around the African continent. On today's uh, program, we discuss the migrant situation in Morocco, the plight of migrants and who takes responsibility of uh, the inhumane treatment African migrants are receiving in Morocco as compared to other migrant situations around the world. Why are African migrants treated as such? We shall uh, discuss on that. We shall equally during the program talk about Cameron Nicoli regarding the recent re report released by the Human Rights Watch accusing separatist fighters for committing gross human rights violation between the period of January to uh, June 2022. However, the uh, Ambassador Interim Government has described the report as baseless. We shall equally uh, discuss that with a cream of panelists this day joining us from around the world to discuss on this topic. We shall begin uh, with uh, Dr. Nick Santo. He's uh, joining us uh, from the United States. Dr. Nick Santo, you are there this afternoon. Thanks for joining us on the program. Thank you very much. Uh Afrid Media for inviting me again to come and share my opinion about uh, what is going on in my homeland. And it's always a pleasure being here. And fellow viewers, I'm glad again to be here to share my opinion with others. And uh, uh, what a beautiful day over here. I hope it's same over there in Cameroon. Thank you. Nick Santo, you are a member of the Cameroon People's Democratic Movement, the CPDM, and former IG leader. And you join us from the United States, so you are equally a human and humanitarian expert. Thanks very much for being there. We have equally Dr. Gabila Nubong, political economist with Northwest University, South Africa. Dr. Nab uh, Gabila, thanks for honoring our, our invitation this day. Uh, thanks uh, for having me, Luis. Uh, good afternoon. That will be afternoon where you are to you, to the rest of the panelists, and uh, to your viewers. And uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to, to be with you, to engage on this uh, very topical issues that face us as Africans and as, as, as Cameroonians. And I look forward to our engagement. An invitation as well. We have uh, equally joining us is uh, John Bakuro. You are the president of consortium, Doctor uh, uh, John Bakuro, president of consortium. Thanks for joining us in the program. Thank you, Luis, and uh, thank you for getting me on. You know, it's always a, a renewed pleasure having the uh, the opportunity to uh, you know present a much uh, you know clearer sight of what is uh, happening with the struggle of the people of the Southern Cameroons for freedom. Uh, I mean, to the people of both the Southern Cameroons and the La Republic of Cameroon watching your program. So thank you for having me on board. Thank you very much. We equally have uh, Gina Elvis. You are the National Communications Secretary of the Popular Action Party. Uh, Gina Elvis, thanks for joining us on the program. Thank you, Mr. Bidben. Good afternoon to all co-panelists. Good afternoon to all viewers of from uh, Africa Media. I think it's a pleasure once again to be on your platform to keep in my own contributions, respect to what is happening back here in Cameroon and, of course, in the continent. Thank you. For, thank you for joining us. We have equally in the studio here with us is uh, Robert Kedia. You are a member of the CPDM. Robert Kedia, it's a pleasure having you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all my co-panelists. Good afternoon to all Africans uh, home and abroad uh, that have taken their time to sit in front of their screen to watch us as we are about to give our own uh, ideas on how Africa can be a better place uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert for joining us. Uh, thanks equally those of you watching us. You can follow us live on Facebook. Leave your comments. We shall read them here uh, in the course of the program. Before we begin our first topic of discussion today, which is looking at the migrant situation in Morocco, we invite you to have a look at this video and just to advise that the video uh, contains images that you might not like and uh, just to remind you of uh, viewers discretion is advised. Let's take a look at this situation in uh, Morocco. This is what African migrants are presently facing in Morocco. Stay with us. We'll come right back. Oh, 
It is reported that 23 migrants died, but others say more than just 23 died as a result of that incident between uh, the borders of Morocco and Spain. Let's begin with you, Dr. Nick Santo. We have uh, this migrant situation from the videos you just watched. What explains or what could possibly explain such treatment or inhumane treatment on African migrants, on African soil as well? Um immigration immigration has been a greatest one of the greatest worries of mankind since from the time of the bible um and what pushed people into immigration into, into immigrating are principally because of instability in the days we used to learn of the full and these wanderers who will wander and settle from areas where there are graze lands to graze their cattle but these days we are experiencing economic migration um and the, one of the either economic migration or political migration because um uh, people feel that when they go to areas that they will have employment they will have opportunities they will can achieve uh, more greener pastures for themselves they turn to migrate um and then another reason is because of wars wars natural disasters and other things but in this case we have seen a persistent influx of uh, africans into europe and the americas uh, that of america also is terrible because they go through the mexico forest and other areas uh, cutting from uh, latin america and uh, other areas to trek on foot to arrive in the united states i mean this is not the first picture we have this is not the first video we are seeing we've seen videos from mexico whereby uh, Africans have uh, uh, been packed in camps and they are on waiting list and there are thousands uh, are waiting to enter the borders of Mexico and the borders of the United States uh, to declare for political asylum. Um, one of the principal reasons is the lack of employment, as I've said, uh, wars and disasters and um, uh, other sort of things. And I think it's high time for us as Africans to start reflecting on how to fix our homeland so that we could um, stop some of this immigration. For example, what is happening in uh, our region of the country today, the Southern Cameroons or Northwest and Southwest region of Cameroon is an eye opener because we have had a lot of immigrants who have come over here that has led to the granting of the temporary protective status for the people of the Northwest and the Southwest regions. So uh, this is a situation which uh, uh, touches my heart because uh, as a psychologist in the U.S., um, I also do immigration counseling as well as uh, receiving some of the victims of trauma and torture. Um, and I work in collaboration with the U.S. government, Department of Health and Immigration to help some of the immigrants over here. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, all boys to our political problems, uh, the wars that are ongoing, uh, the leadership model in Africa, and... Uh, if it points to one other important point that I should call the attention of each and everyone, look at Rwanda today. Rwanda had a genocide. Mm. Rwandese went out in their numbers, but they came back to their country in the time of Kagame and tried to build their country and rebuild their country. And today, they are one of the leading nations in Africa. They are the America of Africa to the extent that if Britain can be contemplating of repatriating refugees to Rwanda, who are coming from Africa so that they should better take political asylum in Rwanda, it means that we can also, after all this chaos, come back to fix our country and make it an 
a, a citadel of Africa. Thank you. And so let me hear from you, Dr. Gabila Nubong. What explains this square treatment received by Africans on African soil, considering that these are people who are running away from uh, political situations in their country? Why are Africans treated like this in Africa by Africans? Well, uh, Luis, I think we've developed a culture of not respecting ourselves as a people. I think it's an indictment on our civilization as, as black people. Uh, because you ask yourself the question, uh, the people that are being treated poorly at the borders, how do their host governments treat them when they are still in their own countries? We have gotten used to the image of black on black violence, you know, the black man treating the black man with violence in order to make a point. And um, once we have that established, by the way, our own governments, our own forces of law and order treat us the way we treat each other. Uh, it, it becomes uh, ingrained in our subconscious and uh, everywhere else where we go, we get treated in exactly the same way. We need to get back to a space where we start respecting ourselves, respecting each other, valuing ourselves and valuing each other. And then people are going to value us. Now, that typically comes with a sense of pride, a sense of pride out of accomplishment where you feel like you're doing something significant that is space worth. Uh, that is currently not the case uh, for us as Africans because of poverty and the development, because of the kinds of government and governance systems that we have, because of our daily reality. We have not come to a place where we value ourselves, where we respect ourselves enough, where we are able to find solutions to solve our problems. And it's not for lack of knowledge. It's not for lack of knowledge because when we exit our existing systems and go to any other parts of the world, we excel. You know, Dr. G Nick Santo is, is, a, is, a, is a, an excellent psychologist in the U.S., uh, exercising his profession and enjoying himself. Uh, would he have been as much a fulfilled psychologist if he was his Cameroon? Would his skill and his knowledge and his know-how have been respected and valorized? Or would he have been expected to uh, go and uh, uh, behind someone to get recognition? So I think it's a principle in life. If you do not respect yourself, nobody's going to respect you. Uh, and as Dr. Nick has said, it's a function of the challenges that uh, these African uh, 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 these people face in their respective countries. We have no consideration for each other. The conflict in the in the southern Cameroons. It's another example of us not respecting each other. It's a practical case of the mismanagement of minority status, um, where you have a, a minority population in a majoritarian governance system that says we are not people the status quo, we want things to change. What has been the response of the government in place and the regime? It's to send out the, 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 the military, you know, send out the soldiers with guns to go and uh, try and, 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 and silence the dissent, shoot the idea. And then in the midst of all of that, you have people like, uh, I'm just trying to get his name again there, you have people like, no, not Elvis, my other uh, panelists, the other panelists sitting there, who are apologists for such regimes, for such systems, that sort of <laughs> come forth and construct uh, ideologic, uh, put up an ideological defense for why the government, not Elvis, not, not Elvis from Pap, I just, I just get the, I forgot to know that gentleman's name, uh, who are, who are who's in the studio with you? who become ideologists, ideologists of, for such regimes, and so, sort of find a justification to explain that law and order needs to be restored at all costs, uh, which is English to say that you need to kill if the, the, whoever it is that has a contrary idea because you want to preserve a certain system. Now, what distinguishes us from animals is the fact that as human beings we are expected to be rational. Rationality says that our actions must be conducted by a certain sense of sequence of logic. And, and if you're going to have a specific action and specific reaction and you have outcomes that are predetermined, you're supposed to be able to change those actions to get different outcomes. Now, if in 2022 and for the last six years, we have a group of people who go to bed and wake up every day and think that is justified for they to use the apparatus of the state to kill their other citizens, it just, is, just reflects a defense of how little we value our lives as individuals. So we don't have no respect for each other, for ourselves. We don't respect ourselves. In our own eyes, our lives are dispensable. So the kinds of atrocities, as we are going to talk about in the course of our conversation, that we see happening by Africans on Africans, you will not see that anywhere else in the world. Even in other parts of Africa, you know, you will not see that anywhere in the world where 
people go on the rampage and kill civilians uh, with impunity in the knowledge of the government. And then we just get a, a, a what do you call those things? You get a, 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 a communique, you know, that acknowledges the incident and says that we are going to institute that investigation. A culture of no accountability because we don't have respect for each other. Now, if we don't respect each other, why would we demand respect from other people? Why should we expect that migrants that end up at the border of Spain to be respected by the Spanish authority when our own authorities don't respect us as a people? So, and then to marry the point that Nick, Nick Santos made earlier on, when you come down to the question of Morocco, you must ask yourself the questions. Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria are countries that sort of share borders with Europe. Why are Moroccans not dying in the sea to go to Europe for a better life? Which is a bit of a controversial topic because, listen, incidentally, I was in Morocco last week and uh, I was attending a conference at the University of uh, Polytechnic that was built by the king. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art, top-notch science facility built by a monarch, not a Democrat, Dr. Nick Santos. Which brings me to my next point, that we have unfortunately so demonstrated ignorance in the midst and the abundance of knowledge that we have locked ourselves down in specific systems as if that is the only way out. So people in the CPDF and my friends sitting in the studio are going to ask us to uh, contest elections if you want to see changes happen on the ground as if the creation of democracy and those who conceptualize the Greek philosophers that conceptualize democracy fell from the sky, they fell from the moon. These are just people that develop systems to solve a set of problems at a specific point in time. Now, if we evolve 20, 30, 40, 60 years down into the line and certain systems are no longer fit for purpose, by all means, let's revise it. And let us respect ourselves and find solutions to our problems. Then the world is going to start respecting us. So let me just and, 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 and stop at that to say, I think the key lies in us getting to a point where we attain superior, con superior, superior consciousness of the value of each other's life. You know, that I can disagree with me and we exchange some ideas. I learn from him, he learns from me, and then together we come up with solutions that move us forward as a people. And then you're going to give a whole hope to a new generation of Africans. Africans has ended up with a group of leaders, you know, as I stopped. The generation of African leaders that attained independence were inspirational. They had a vision for where they wanted to take the continent. They were proud of themselves, proud of the newly acquired countries. Between 1960 and 1972, Cameroon experienced one of its biggest boom in infrastructure in, uh, uh, development. The seaports, the airports, almost all the roads that we have in Cameroon today were constructed by Aijo under a dictatorial regime, uh, Comrade Nick Santos, uh, with you and your party, the, the Democrats. So we need to progressively move away from some of these boxes that we have locked ourselves in. And I'm not arguing against democracy because for all intents and purposes, the best tool we have at the moment. But, but we need to be able to go over and above that to start coming up with solutions that respect each other, look for practical answers to real problems, give the youth hope because we have it in us. It's not for lack of intelligence, it's not for lack of knowledge. It's, that, it's not that we don't know what we, what we need to do is that our mindset needs to be revolved, needs to be enlightened. We need to start uh, gain a new level of consciousness to start being able to dream about the possibilities of a good, well-run, successfully managed country where the youths have a reason to want to stay instead of wanting to leave. Let me stop at that piece and so that uh, we can give, yeah, give more room for in your conversation. Got your, we got your intervention, and uh, we now hear from you, uh, John Bakuro. When you look at what is happening in Morocco, do you think uh, it's linked to the numerous boat capsides? We hear that migrant boats have capsized, and this happened and that happened. And this is coming equally shortly after the first uh, British flight to, for the deportation of migrants to Rwanda failed to take off. Now, how do you link these situations? Is someone preventing or paying uh, from the West to stop Africans from crossing over? Or why do you think this is happening? We must begin by looking at it from the uh, perspective that uh, normally, why are Africans first of all crossing over in droves? Why don't we also have Europeans crossing in droves to the African continent? The answer here is simple. I mean, Dr. Gabila made a very succinct and clear point. If the policies on the continent 
do not change. Do not expect change at any time. Do we respect human life in our countries? If we were respecting human lives in our countries, we would be outraged as, at what is happening elsewhere. A case in point, how many African leaders have come up even just on Twitter to show outrage at these images that you just showed us? Can you name one? Because the sanctity of life means nothing to our African leaders they don't care what happens to us, even in our various countries. That is why they don't bother about what is happening to our people elsewhere. If these were French people, brutally murdered like that, I assure you that Paul Bia would already have risen from the sickbed wherever he is and would be on his way to Paris to go and march to protest. This is the truth. If it happens to, to French citizens, you hear all the leaders in Semak, all of them. Unfortunately, that is the fate of the black person. Now, it, it doesn't surprise me that it happens in Morocco because the citizens of North uh, Africa, they too consider themselves as whites. A lot of the times, they don't even want to you know, come to agreement that they are Africans. They only describe themselves as uh, Africans when there is something to benefit, when it concerns the nation's cup, and they have to start saying how they are poorly treated, that's when they become Africans. When they are at the World Cup and they need support from the continent, that is when they become Africans. But when it has to do with the kind of treatment they give to our people, they remind us that we are not one people. But now, looking back within, the solution to this will simply be governance. If you have good governance across the African continent, a lot of jobs will be created on the spot. Young people will not be abandoning their villages, their countries, I mean, their cities, to take the risk to go and die in the sea. Because, uh, 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 Louis, at the moment you and I are talking, expressing outrage at what has happened, there are others busy preparing to get into the sea. I mean, even as we talk, there are others preparing to get into the sea because they have come to the natural conclusion that their countries are worse than death, that their countries are worse than hell. I had the opportunity to talk to some Africans on the Mexican border, a good lot of them Cameroonians, not just people from the southern Cameroons, a good lot of them Cameroonians who express the feeling that even when they are being tortured along the way, they take it with grace because that torture is less than the kind of torture they get back at home. So, when we come here and then we express outrage at the white man, at the Spanish, at the, at the, the Moroccans, I say this is all counterproductive. Because like Dr. Gabila pointed out a while ago, my friend, Mr. Kedia, is seated there in the studio. He is a young man. He happens to be privileged to be among those who have the opportunity to eat the illicit money in Cameroon, who has the opportunity to, you know, settle where he can get free money and enjoy himself and his family. And now he will sit there and tell you that this is the best system ever. Whereas when he gets up, he can't even visit his people in Dom. If he must go there in Gokotunjia, he will move on a road that is horrible. I mean, a kind of road that you don't expect any country to have linking major cities in the third millennium. So when you have young people who ought to rise up there to ask for situations to change, to ask for better conditions, not only for themselves, but for their, for their kind, who would rather sit there to glorify failure? Who would rather sit there to give a pat on the back of evil, how do you expect that anyone treats us out of Africa with any kind of respect? It's the same thing I'll be saying to my brother, uh, Dr. Nick Santos here. Fortunately, I heard you in the first few words, at least already condemning bad governance. If you really settle down and become an apologist to those systems that perpetuate this bad governance, and then when faced with a situation like this one, you talk of bad governance. I say, my brother, if we really have feelings for those, our brothers and sisters on the continent, 
who are dying in this kind of in, in this kind of way, in this kind of horrible uh, a way, in this shameful manner, it is our duty to honestly, sincerely, clearly say no to the little crumbs that are falling from the tables of those who are oppressing our people and rather rise up to fight for an egalitarian society. That is the only way we'll be able to stop our brothers and sisters from the continent, from dying in the shameful manner that we are seeing. And you agree with me that even when those that have managed and gotten to the diaspora start feeling like we need to use the money that we get with all the strain and stress to change things for our brothers and sisters back on the continent, you still have this old evil politician standing on the way. Because for them, they don't see the good intentions of those who want to change the lives of the people. They rather see people struggling to replace them. Because what matters to them is that power, the megalomanic power. I rest my case. Uh, John Bakuru, we got you very well. Let's hear from uh, Gene Elvis. Now, Gene Elvis, we look at uh, the fact that the African Union and other organizations have simply called for investigation. We understand that this is not the first time we seen migrants being treated like this, especially uh, African migrants. Do you think this investigation is going to yield any fruit? And what is your comment when you look at how African migrants are treated and uh, the speedy nature and how quickly the situation of Ukraine was intervened uh, in by uh, Western organizations? Now, what's your comment regarding how Africans are being treated with regards to being migrants? Okay, uh, thank you very much for those questions. I will begin with um, uh, the African Union. When you say the African Union has called for investigation, so the question I would rather begin by asking is who is supposed to carry out the investigations? And um, uh, who is the African Union in the first place to call for investigations? Because, you know, one thing about Africa is that we do not even have any voice anyway. You see, the AU perimeter is a serious um, uh, bulldog. They do not have any voice and they have no influence uh, anyway, when they call for investigation, like I say, who is going to carry out these investigations to be able to throw more light on what is happening to our African brothers back there al along the Moroccan uh, Spanish borders? Uh, you, you, you make mention of um, uh, Western organizations that quickly intervene with uh, the case in, in Ukraine. But remember that even with the case in Ukraine, we still saw Africans who were sidelined when it came to rescuing people or giving access to those who were escaping the war from Ukraine to get into other European countries. Africans were not accepted, but I like the fact you pointed out that uh, we saw Western organizations intervene rapidly to save the lives of the Europeans who were escaping from Ukraine. The question is, have we any institutions in Africa that can stand for the rights of the Africans? I would say no. Maybe the greatest uh, of the institution that we have as of now is the AU, but the AU to me is an overseas branch of, um, a, the, of, of the European Union. They have no voice and they have no authority anywhere. Even if you go up to the level of the UN, let me tell you that Africa as a continent, I am not talking about maybe Cameroon as a country, Africa as a continent does not even have any voice at all at the level of the UN. Remember that even if we start up today as Africans to say yes, to something, France as an individual, as minute as they are, they can simply say no, and it, it kills the whole thing. If we say no to something as a continent, France alone can stand to say yes to it, and it goes the way France wants it. So one thing we should understand is that as Africans, we need to first of all, maybe at the level of institutions, create for ourselves powerful institutions that have influence first over our African countries per se, and then the, the, the world at large, because when we talk about institutions, come back just to the wars today, because the wars in Africa, for instance, are one of the reasons for which most African youths are trying to leave the continent today. But now, let's come back to my country, Cameroon, and what is happening in the former British Southern Cameroon. What has the AU been able to do, for instance? Absolutely nothing. What have they said? Nothing. I always have this habit of saying that when I hear people say they condemn with the last energy, I don't understand the meaning of last energy. We want institutions that can act and not just people who sit and sign communiques or press release and say they condemn things with, 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 with um, uh, the last energy. How do you explain, for instance, the fact that a war between Ukraine and, the, uh, uh, and Russia 
has been able to paralyze an entire African continent. How do you explain that? This is to tell me, to my next point, to tell you that at what point in time, Luis, you see, uh, at one point, the, 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 the least you can offer some people at a time is just hope. And it is this hope that our African governments have failed to give the African youth, and that's why they would prefer, like some um, uh, my, my three, the other panelists who I spoke before me have said before, they would prefer to die trying to cross the seas than to stay back here in the continent because even that hope, their governments are no longer capable of giving them this hope. Come to think of it, if you go back to my native hope where I come from, today as we talk, you see, there is weeks that... Some youth are trying to experiment and grow back there in Oku, but then, come to think of it, what is the regime in place doing to see into either they can promote the cultivation of this wheat, for instance? These are things that if the governments were good, if we had good leadership in Africa, they could create jobs back here in the, in the, in the continent that will withhold our young people from always thinking that the best they can do for themselves is trying to leave the continent. But unfortunately, we have leaders who have been... Um, uh, it's up by what I would call the Puma virus. Everything for them and nothing for any other person. They think about themselves first, they think about themselves second, and they think about themselves thirdly. In other words, after them, they do not see any other person that can uh, take over from them. After them, it's, it's like after they leave government or after they die, the culture itself is going to, to, to die. That is the problem we have with Africa. And you know, once you do not have that self-esteem, once you do not have that respect for yourself, you will not expect a neighbor to respect you when you don't even respect yourself. If you have a drinking pail in your house, Mr. Biben, which you use to drop in your floor, then be sure that even your neighbor will beg that pail to drop in his floor with it. But if you have a drinking pail that you always make sure you keep clean and the neighbor see the way you handle your drinking pail, they cannot use that pail to, to drag in their flaws. But the unfortunate thing is that even amongst us Africans, like other planets have already mentioned, we do not have that respect for ourselves. You see, think of the type of treatment that we see our own leaders give the, uh, 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 our own very brothers back here. It is not the type of treatment that will encourage any other person out of this continent or even our Maghrebian brothers to want to think that they could respect any other person with the black skin. Secondly, when you ask, for instance, to find out why is it that Africans are treated the way they are treated, we should not forget that be it before the colonial period or till now, the Europeans have never had any respect for us. When they come to us in Africa, it is because they have their interest to safeguard. They are not coming because they see in us equals. That's one thing we need to understand too. And until we begin to give ourselves that self-respect, until we impose ourselves to the world, you see, we would be accepted by them. And that's why I keep saying we have mentioned here bad leadership. It is a factual problem. It is something that we need to take into consideration and we work serious on it. We have leaders in the continent today who in reality may be, may, they may have a dark skin like you and I, but psychologically they are not Africans. If I tell Mr. Biapol in Cameroon, I don't seem to be a Cameroonian. I don't seem to be an African. These are people who have a Western culture, people who school in Europe, came back with the Western culture, with the Western mentality, and they are acting as stooges, working to the best interest of those who place them where they are, working to the best interest of those who are protecting them where they are, and they work to safeguard the interest of the, 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 the Europeans than that of their African uh, brothers and, 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 and continent. Like somebody mentioned, come to think of it, if the migrants we are talking about today, if they were French citizens, believe you me, we should have gotten a, a, a condolence messages streaming in from all parts of Africa to the French uh, uh, community, condoling with them. But when Africans die within the African continent, when Africans are killed within their own very countries, we don't see leaders anywhere. I am trying to limit myself to Cameroon. Since 2016, for instance, to today, can you cite any instance where Mr. Biapol, for instance, as the head of state, has gotten up to address a message to the people of the former British Southern Cameroon that can give them the impression that at least a leader that has concern for them has spoken and has said something that is touching and consoling that could even cause them at least to want to rethink maybe the decisions that they have taken. No way. Each time they have an opportunity to talk, it is rather to do what? To some sort of provoke the people the more by being so arrogant and letting you think that if that it is only through the barrel of the gun that we can resolve our issues in Africa, which is not the case. I am happy Dr. Nick Santos mentioned the fact that um, uh, the Rwandese are coming back into their country after the genocide in 1994, and that Rwanda today is like um, uh, uh, the, one of the fast advancing countries in Africa. It's good. 
We are not that, but we should ask ourselves the questions: Why will Rwandans who fled the country be coming back into the country today? Because at least to some extent, Paul Kagame is trying to work towards the interest of the people, and we are saying that that is the problem we lack here in Africa. We need leaders who think African. We need leaders who think about the people. We need to understand that whatever thing we are doing here today in Africa, we are not doing for ourselves. We are doing it for posterity. We are doing it for our children. We are doing it for the generation that are still to come. It must not be about those of us who are here living today. And that's the unfortunate we regret because, like people have said, and I will say it again here, we have leaders who think that Africa is for them. They have people think, for instance, that Cameroon is theirs, and that after them, no other person exists. Nothing else happens. Secondly, why are our people treated the way they are treated? Why are they feeding the country? We come back to the educational system. Unfortunately, some of them will flee the countries even without any form of training. But if at least within the country we have educational systems that are adapted to train the youth to be able to gainfully employ themselves after education, at least a, a number of them could stay back here and be able to create something for themselves that would at least help them sustain their lives and their immediate families. But come to think of it, we have a kick educational system inherited from the colonial masters that only teach us nothing but how to read and write. So how do you expect us to evolve? We are talking about an, uh, a, a, an entire continent that still has agriculture as its backbone. But then, like I say, when there is a small war between Ukraine and Russia, the entire continent becomes crippled because none of the African countries produces wheat, for instance. One from, from where from which um, they can build their bread. But come to think of it, like I mentioned, my native Oku there. If I consider the weather condition, the climatic condition of Oku, and I imagine that today there are young people that are trying to experiment the, the, the color of wheat, then I want to think that there are many more places, even within that same region, where wheat could be cultivated. But will the government decide to, uh, to expand? The cultivation of this to other parts of the country, to other parts of the region, such that many youth could be engulfed into it and thereby what away that mentality of leaving the continent? I don't think so. Secondly, corruption is another factor. You even have those who have gone to school who can employ themselves gainfully in one way or the other, but you cannot create companies back in this country because the tax system is not business friendly. Secondly, if you are even eligible for a job somewhere, you need to know someone somewhere who knows another person somewhere before you are granted that opportunity to be able to do something. All of these things are things that do not permit the Cameroonian or the African youth in general to want to stay back, back here. Reason why many of them would prefer to go the hard way, the only way, to be able to see if they can make ends meet in other parts of the, of, of, of the world. Unfortunately, we know that Europe in general has never been a friendly continent to Africa. They only come to us to safeguard their interests. They only come to us with... Uh, 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 to, to, to tap from our continent, and I say it is very, very regrettable, and uh, until we begin to change our mindset, until we change the mentalities, and like I think um, Mr. John Ba Akuru was just saying here, I want to, 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 to end at that level by saying, the African youth need to understand that we have come to a point in time where we must stand up as a people to defend our interests within our continent. There is no place like home. I am back here talking, not because I am quite comfortable with the situation, but I think that if other African youth could join them to their voices to be more concerned with the political situation, the political lives of their countries, I think, for once, we'll be able to stand up and challenge the present regimes that we have in place and push this government, this whole uh, 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 government that are in place, such that a new blood can come in with a new vision for Africa. Remember that they have even, they, they, there is what I call a passive dictatorship, which they have used to kill even the zeal in African used to want to join in politics. When you come back to Cameroon, for instance, back here, there are very few of them who are interested in, in, in politics. But what they fail to understand is that, like they commonly say in Pigeon here in Cameroon, if you do, if you don't do politics, politics could do you. If you try to shy away from politics, those leaders who are there, they take it as an opportunity to impose on you that which they think is good for them and not good for you necessarily. Come to think of the, 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 the taxes, for instance, that we pay today, maybe on money transfer in the country. Come to think of the fact that today, a liter of oil that used to cost 1,200 francs is at 2,000 francs, and you don't even find it in the market. These are things that African youth need to understand, come together and get more involved in the political lifestyle of their countries, get more involved in actions and movements that can help us set away these old regimes that have taken an entire continent hostage, and we are rather paying the price. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Gene Elvis. Uh, thanks very much for the opinion. Now, let's get to talk with you, uh, Robert Kedia, member of CPGM. You are a young man and a politician. What do you think are uh, some of the reasons why the young people are leaving the African continent? Most have cited bad governance as reasons why young people are forced out of their countries, out of their comfort zones, in search of for greener pastures. Migration, we know that uh, there are the push factors and the pull factors. Uh, many of the panelists have concentrated on uh, the push factors rather than to talk about the pull factors. They see the evil aspect back at home and they have cited many of them. Some have talked about wars that are happening in the continent. Some have talked about uh, the fact that they are looking for greener pastures, the fact that they are looking for jobs uh, and all the like they have uh, they have listed and uh, all of them do have uh, their reasons and they are saying the truth in their perspective of view which uh, I actually accept with uh, many of them uh, but before I go ahead I would like to pass my condolences to all the bereaved family of the African continent that have lost their brothers and sisters in this uh, barbaric uh, treatment uh, that occurred in Morocco and uh, many of them have lost their life and um, I want to make this clear it is not something that was done by the Europeans no it was not something that was done by the West it was something that was done by Africans and Africans and uh, I would like to let uh, the African Union know that uh, this country Morocco have violated uh, the human right uh, CETA which I believe they are a signatory to and uh, with regards to the viol violation, firstly, they have violated the people with the aspect of torture. The people actually have been tortured to death. Secondly, uh, one of the uh, uh, aspects of the human right uh, in the charter talk about a, a right to life. And uh, many of them have been killed, meaning that their life has been taken away. That's the second offense committed by the people of uh, Morocco. Thirdly, they have violated uh, the, the tri various treaties which has to do with taking care of a migrant when a migrant is within your territory. That aspect also has been violated by the people of Morocco. And finally, we have the act of uh, racism where the people of the northern part of Africa have decided to be ruth quarrel and deadly to their fellow brothers of Africa just because they have a black skin and they have a white skin. And I think that uh, the African Union is supposed to carry out sanctions immediately uh, to these uh, countries in the northern part of Africa because all the policemen that I saw, they were all white and uh, uh, people of different city, uh, different country cannot be a police cannot be a, uh, members of the police force in another country. So Morocco is wholly responsible for that. And I believe that if the African Union can decide to give them sanction, and uh, all the other African countries in the sub-Sahara Africa give them to bilateral uh, sanction, you will definitely uh, reduce this rate. Because I've been hearing about these things. Even before I came as a young man, this thing has been happening. When we hear about long sleeve, short sleeve in the desert, that's the treatment that the people of Morocco have been giving uh, the people of the black skin, uh, which we are supposed to denounce and decry with last other and uh, participate with our government and the African Union so that we can uh, sanction them. Mr. Ben Luis, I know us Africa, we have our own issues within us and within our countries that actually we are not happy with because there's no perfect country but uh, if a citizen of Morocco was actually watching this program and see people of black skin their reaction after the people of Morocco with white skin have massacred killed our fellow African because they have black skin and they come and watch them on TV and instead of people to talk about how queer they are instead of people to talk about how the African Union is supposed to sanction them instead of uh, them to talk about the various aspects of human rights that have been violated but uh, they abandon it to instead talk about governance which they have the reason and to start criticizing when those people in Morocco they get such aspect and such outing it gives them the land right 
to violate the more because some uh, uh, Africans of the sub-Sahara Africa believe that uh, that they don't respect themselves as black so those in northern Africa should feel free to violate and <coughs> kill the blacks because even they in sub-Sahara Africa they don't respect themselves they don't value their own life is that what we are telling those in Morocco watching us uh, I would not like to be among and uh, Mr. Ben Luis, this is an issue that concerns the entire Africa, which uh, the entire continent, which we are supposed to talk about it seriously and not come out to call the name of a president to say the president is on its sick bed or to come and say the president of a particular country uh, is not actually a Cameroonian because I have another mentality is wrong. We should not say things we can defend within the context of the law. We should respect the law. We should try to be much more of examples rather than be at least critics. We should participate in our own quarters. When you look at the civilization in China, which is a powerful nation today, and another co-panelist talked about those in Rwanda that they went abroad and they came back. When they were coming back to Rwanda, Rwanda was not a perfect place. Those that went and studied abroad and returned to China, China was not a safe heaven. But they came back. Not looking at their benefit back in Europe and the millions that were proposed. But they decided to go back to China with a harsh environment in China. They went back to participate for the development of China. I believe that if our African brothers in Europe, America, Canada and the rest, they can come back to the continent and assist those that are here. So that we can be able to build a powerful nation, a powerful continent for ourselves. I know most of them criticize because they have seen the, 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 the human rights. It is perfectly sweet in Europe. It is perfectly sweet in America. But a lot of life was lost. A lot of war battles were being fought for that to be a thing. And in our own continent, we need to put a lot of effort too. We need to fight too and ensure that such human rights are being attained in our own continent. Uh, one of our co-panelists is in South Africa, and he also sees what is happening there. The way foreigners have been treated also in South Africa, he knows about it. He must have studied about apartheid and know the treatment that the black people have gone through in that country, but he knows the effort that has been put in, and that is still being ongoing to ensure that such uh, 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 violations are being prohibited. And that is what is important. We should be talking about how, what are the means way forward so that the continent can be able to ensure that human rights are not being violated. Rather than stay at the level of criticizing, insulting that this president is sick, this president has this mentality, this one has... What is the way forward? We are talking about proposal on how to build our continent and not criticizing. Criticizing is not a solution, but bringing out solution will help the entire continent. African media has been watched all over the world and many African presidents participate in these programs and they will be waiting for us to give them our own suggestion on how the continent can be built, on how the continent can evolve in the uh, uh, respect of fundamental human rights, which these are the things we should be able to share and we decry the violation that have occurred in northern part of Africa and maybe little less of criticism and insult like our co-panelists are doing. Criticizing and insult will definitely bring more humiliation to the black race rather than protecting and giving it a lot of prestige. Thank you very much, Robert Kidia. I wish we had more time to continue talking about the inhumane treatment of migrants in uh, Morocco, between the borders of Morocco and Spain. But it's time for us to move into talking on our second topic of the day, which is the Anglophone crisis still ongoing in the English speaking regions of Cameroon. On Monday, uh, June 27, the Human Rights Watch released a report which uh, constitutes a period of January to June 2022 and it stated that separatist fighters operating in these two regions have committed human rights violations. The uh, documented series of atrocities committed by the separatist uh, fighters in those two regions. Uh, let's talk with you, Dr. Nick Santo. What's your appraisal on the recent reports released by the Human Rights Watch which indicts separatist fighters 
operating in these two regions, they've said to have committed human rights violations, which uh, ranges from kidnappings and torture and, all, and raping as well as others. Dr. Nick Santos. Um, thank you very much for giving me another opportunity to express myself. Um, before I go directly to that question, I was about saying something here, or I was putting, I was putting down something while my colleague was talking. And I think he took a lot of words from my mouth because I was about to say that criticizing is one thing and making steps to correct is another. It is not where you stand or the uniform you wear, but the ability for your voice to be heard. Being in the CPDM, I dissociated myself with human rights violators, kidnappers, and scammers. Uh, being there gives me an opportunity to reform from within. Lying to, instead of lying to myself of belonging to a country, to a country that doesn't exist, which is mind disturbing. And I believe being true to myself that I am a Cameroonian helps rather than hallucinating about an internet republic and seven presidents, which is untrue. From that analogy, you can come to this point that and most of us have been, had been carried away by lies. We have been carried away by a lot of uh, 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 deception. I mean, I sometimes I look at myself as a, as a psychologist. How did I get myself to this? Because previously, you will, know, you will know that I had begun my activism within the CPDM right back in the days in the University of Boya, where I was the vice president of the Muliko subsection of the CPDM, installed by Mbela Charles Mungi. And because of my sympathy, with the marginalization, God made this far to, I mean, express some sympathy with the butchery on the ground. But after that, I came to realize that we were being manipulated. We've been manipulated by people who had ulterior motives. We had armed robbers, we had scammers and jobless persons in the names of pastors. We had a lot of people who went, I mean, we had business, we have business people. Business people on both sides of the aisle, even within the CPGM government, there are business people who are using this conflict for their own personal aggrandizement. There are armed robbers who have just been legalized in carrying out a, uh, kidnapping, kidnapping their neighbors. People have expressed their jealousy. If they are envious of you or if you have a land problem with them, they will go and pay for people to come and kidnap you in the guise of this uh, political brouhaha. So let me tell you, there's a lot going on in this conflict. Uh, one of my friends said, "This Anglozonian, Anglozonians, which means the thieves within the Anglophone community, who are who are using this now to inflict mayhem on their enemies, and there's the Yawundezonians, which means government officials who have decided to be making business, big business out of this crisis. So the Anglozonians and the uh, Yawundezonians have created the Amazonian." So in that, the population will understand that the business people on the government side and the thieves, on the other hand, have decided to divert from the anglophone problem, which was marginalization that we know stemmed from teachers and lawyers, to now create another problem which is bigger than the anglophone problem, which is the Ambazonia problem. So the Ambazonia problem is a product of inadequate addressing of the anglophone problem. So when you look at this, you see that some of us who can be able to psychoanalyze, I'm a problem solver. I solve problems within the U.S. government for the Bureau for Families and Children, for families. As well, I learned about uh, conflict resolution, problem troubleshooting, and uh, uh, critical analysis. How to, if I were to say in strict sense that this problem is it basically a CPDM problem? It is not. It is far bigger than a CPDM problem. People have taken opportunity to come after the CPDM and come after the good ones in government because they are using this conflict for their own personal uh, 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 enrichment. And so I will tell you that one of the reasons why I abandoned the separatist movement was because, first and foremost, as a humanitarian professional, I don't see myself whining and dining with kidnappers, scammers, 
thieves, abductors, rapists. That is not what I studied to become. So I would prefer to stay where I had been so that I can have a clearer picture of remaining within a Cameroon that I know that is true and real rather than following abstracts or deceiving myself about an idiosyncratic nation that does not exist. So I want to tell you that truly, truly, the separatists, the extremist separatists and thieves and kidnappers who are inflicting mayhem on their people, like those who abducted Regina Mundi and was passing in their bedrooms death sentences, that was a mockery, a mockery to the world. And when I look at that, I ask myself, how did I find myself amongst people who are passing death sentences in their bedrooms? Where, what law school did they go to? To adjudicate on human life and declare somebody to be killed on a certain day? That is horrible. Are we in our senses? I ask these people, because let me tell you, we have painted a very bad image about ourselves. That we need to repent. We need to apologize also, not only the government. And so, I, I will not stay outside and be grumbling. It's a time for me to come in. I'm 50 years and above. This is our generation. There is a transition. And we have to, some of us have to contribute positively with the knowledge we have studied abroad to develop Cameroon. I am for one Cameroon. And I believe that we are not the best, but we are making efforts in the right direction. The separatists who have been killing people and abducting people have inflicted a lot of mayhem on our people and they have inflicted uh, a lot of suffering on our people as well as the business people on the side of government who are <laughs> making a lot of money from this nonsense. So some of us are within the CPDM, not because we love to be there, but we think that our voices, and especially myself, my voice is better heard now from within than when I was without. Thank you. Santo, let's hear from you, Dr. Gabila. What do you make of the reports by the Human Rights Watch? Uh, the Amazonian Governing Council has dismissed the report as baseless, but we realize that most of the reports or previous reports of the Human Rights Watch had indicted the Cameroon military. This time around, the separatist fighters have been indicted by the Human Rights Watch for committing gross human rights violations. What do you make of that? Uh, listen, Liz, I've, I've, I've browsed through the report very briefly, and um, in all honesty, I, I personally think it's the natural consequences of conflict. Um, it's been six years. There has been a collapse of the state apparatus. There has been a collapse of the security system. There have been circulation of weapons, and um, people have access to guns in the absence of regulated authority that has control over specific territory there's chaos and where there's chaos you expect excesses in human behavior it's it's completely rational can be expected it's not justifiable it's not justified it's not acceptable but it's a reality because that's the nature of conflicts and and that is one of the more reasons why we should do everything to make sure that this conflict comes to an end uh, there's no point, I mean, of course, Illyria uh, of Human Rights Watch, is it Illyria of Valeria? I can't remember how, what you call her name. Um, she has produced reports in the past that has been used to indict uh, the government for its actions, and now her report is being used to indict the non-state actors for their actions. And then every time she produces one report or the other, one person takes it and runs with it and says, you see, Illyria has now said that you are also committing human rights violations. At the end of the day, you know, we operate in the land of an eye for an eye, and at the end, the long run, everybody's going to be blind. It doesn't matter who commits human rights violations, whether it be the non-state actors or it be the government of Cameroon. At the end of the day, they are victims that receive the actions of those perpetration. Every conflict that leads to violation of human rights ultimately gets uh, prosecuted at the end of the conflict. And so every party is supposed to be conscientized about the importance of respecting the rights of those who are caught in the middle of the conflict. As a society, as a community of, 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 of people, I think that we need to rise above the blame game. I know that my friend uh, Kelia would want to jump on such an opportunity and point to the extent to which the, what they like to call the separatists have gone on and created chaos uh, on the on the ground and, and all the, the the different ways in which they're making the lives of the people miserable like my my friend uh, dr nick santos has has just earlier on alluded but 
to the people of the Southern Cameroons, I need us to understand that we have a specific history. There's a journey that we're undertaking to get to this point. And after this conflict, we are going to remain a people. And that's what I want Dr. Nick Santos to remember. I want him to remember that uh, as much as there's a third republic in the, in the making that we need to all prepare for and we want to be participants involved in that process, history tends to be very, uh, very, uh, what is the word? History tends to be very hard on people who uh, sort of gets to a space where they begin to articulate the material suffering of our people in some of the terms in which uh, he's articulating. I don't know whether he does that as political expediency or he's profoundly uh, convinced about the choice of words that he has used about this, this what is going on on the ground. But in his shoe, I would be, I would be a bit more reserved in trying to have a better understanding of, we came from a specific uh, past, we were motivated by a certain set, set of factors. We had a specific desire to get out of uh, a place. There's a desire to build, there's a desire to construct. We want to build for ourselves a better society. A lot of people have come at those things with their strengths and their weakness. A lot of people do have done extremely good work in terms of articulating the issues as to how we may find solutions. A lot of people have also done wrong. But in the balance of things, or I think this generation has done what very few generations in the last 20, 30, 40 years have done, which is to stand up and say that it cannot be business as usual. And I think it needs, we need to be commended for that. And I think that we need to therefore then build a coalition of people that are forward-looking, positive, like uh, uh, Mr. Kedia in the studio, to say, let's be solutions-oriented. And to Mr. Kedia, critique. It's a fundamental uh, component of, of scientific methodology for a generation of new knowledge. It's not because somebody criticized the necessarily not interested in progress. Because if you are going to, I mean, if you read written scientific papers, it's the basis of every form of knowledge generation. You start by critique. You know, they call it literature review or a critical review of the literature where you do an assessment of the status quo in order to identify gaps so they can make recommendations as to how to move it forward. So it's not everybody that is criticizing the regime that is necessarily criticizing. And I don't know what you call a criticism, because if I tell you that you're wearing a blue blue, blue jacket and your jacket is blue, is that a criticism or is it a statement of fact? Now, when you come to the definition of governance and governance parameters and what constitutes good governance, it's a, you, you have objective, verifiable tools by which you can assess whether or not the government is doing well or not doing well. And if those tools are objective and scientifically verifiable as they are comparable with the governance of other countries, it does not constitute criticism as in blowing hot air. It's essentially like saying, using just the examples that we have used in this debate, of saying that when you compare the Cameroon government and the Rwandan government, the Rwandan government is doing something the Cameroon government is not doing that attracts appreciation from the rest of the people. Now, you may choose to call that bad governance or find other tools of explaining how that is, but at the end of the day, that is being articulated with a desire of saying that all of the actors, yourself inclusive, with your party, and Dr. Nick Santos, we need to have a collective joint conversation that seeks to identify ways of doing better. And you cannot start up to talk about ways of doing better without identifying the gaps. So to come back to your question and to very briefly conclude on that, we need to find ways of bringing this conflict to an end. We should, I'm not interested in the blame game. Who is responsible for more, more atrocities than the others? At the end of the day, an atrocity inflicted by the government of Cameroon and atrocity inflicted by the non-state actors is an atrocity that has been inflicted on the people of the southern Cameroons. These are the people that we are concerned about. These are the people for whom we are seeking a better life. And this is the essence of this. It's not just a question of because, coming back to Dr. Nick Santos, the, the preparation of a third republic and regime change. It's a political objective. It may or may not lead to a better life for our people. It's a completely dependent upon how that process is managed and what kind of outcomes result from that. You know, but at the end of the day, I feel that all of us in this room, we share one thing in common. We want to be able to wake up in a just, fair, egalitarian society that takes care of its people, that uses public resources to provide opportunities for the people. That is the bottom line of this. That is why we bother to sit down and have all these analysis and exchanges, because we dream of the establishment of a society that is just, fair, egalitarian, well governed that distributes resources in a fair and acceptable manner a society in which everybody feels a sense of belonging you know in the absence of that the whole rhetorics of i believe in one cameroon or i believe in the united cameroon that's rhetoric you know it's 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 uh it's rhetoric it's blowing hot air it doesn't make any substance if you believe in one cameroon dr nick santos you will not be in the u.s you'll be a psychologist in cameroon 
<laughs> but on the balance of opportunities, you know, you, you have a better life in the US as myself. But I know that there's one thing that we all share fundamentally. We, we believe we can do better. And we want better for our people. And, and I think that if we take that as a point of departure, we should be able to then start having language that says, how can we make it better? How can we ensure that a child that is born in the middle of Ndopingo, Tunja, goes up and becomes a nuclear scientist? Having all the opportunities at their doorstep, without having to travel out of Ndop to be able to go to Harvard or to MIT, to be able to fulfill their dreams, to find a cure for AIDS, you know, to be able to reach their highest scientific potential. That is the primary responsibility of governance. And that is the primary legitimacy of governance. The legitimacy of governance is not just the ability to be able to win elections and then claim the rights to speak for the people. I see my friend Mr. Keta is laughing in there, but that is the primary responsibility. A lot of our party politi politicians have become so obsessed with a tool that they forget the objective of why that tool was created. And people think that just because they can win the votes and the support and the sympathy of the people, then it legitimizes their right to stay on them. No. Government is government because it stands in the place to make use of the general public resources for the general good. That is what makes it a legitimate government. Not because you won an election. Now, if you get to a space where you are no longer performing the stations, by all means, you are supposed to be challenged. There's nobody that was born with the right to become a minister or a president. President Bia, the head of your party, Dr. Nissan, he's a Cameroonian with an ID card just like you and I. He's occupying an office that has been given to him by the people, and the people are supposed to hold him accountable together with his minister. That is the essence of governance. And he is not making use of, his, of the process of his father's plantation to be able to run the country. He gets taxpayers' money, which is public resources, resources gathered from the exploitation of nation, nation, national resources. It is the common wealth of the people. It belongs to the people, not to the ruling class. It belongs to the people. The people give a mandate to the ruling class to rule on behalf of the people. It is ultimately our resources. Gold, oil, diamond that is found in Cameroon does not automatically belong to any person because they're in government. It belongs to the people. That is the right of citizenship. That I belong to a common geographical space that has wealth. That we are supposed to confide to certain people to manage on our behalf. And hold them accountable. Not party politics in the kind that Mr. Kajan likes to talk about because he's a very fine sounding politician. Every time he talks, I want to laugh because he incarnates the kind of politics that we have come, come, come used to. But, but we need to go past that. You know, he may do that as a profession, get a salary at the end of the month. That's fine. But, but as a people, as a collective, we need to ultimately get to that space where we start having real conversations. How do we improve the lives of people? How do we give somebody end up an opportunity? How do we stop people from dying from preventable diseases? How do we stop people from dying on accidents on roads that have been constructed? How do we stop people from practical real issues that say that we have evolved, evolved as a people? We can take care of ourselves. Like I can wake up in a secure house with lights that is supplying, bathe clean water, drink clean water, get into my car that is well serviced, drive on a proper road and go into a compost or open a business and create jobs for other people. Living in a civilized society in 2022. This is what this is about. Creating opportunities for everybody, not uh, perpetuating ourselves in, in government and then coming back with the kind of uh, dogmatic rhetoric that Mr. Kieran likes to spill out every time he's talking. When he talks, I laugh. I, I sometimes, well, I think politicians, some politicians are aliens, Dr. Nick Santos, your colleagues, I don't know where you guys come from. It's as if we live on a completely different planet from the rest of us. Because you come and you sometimes talk and we look at you, we do not wonder whether you're looking at the same realities that we're looking at. But I guess it makes our lives interesting. But, but the people must come first, is the point I'm trying to make, this. But th thanks so much for that. And I know that Mr. Kedia is going to crucify me for everything that I've said. But I'm looking forward to hearing his input on that. <laughs> but the people must come first. You know, the tools, the frameworks, all the other things that we like to make reference to, it's secondary. It's about the people. And that's what ought to matter. And we need to then start taking care of the people and respecting ourselves. And everybody else is going to respect us. Abila Lubong, thanks very much for that. Let me hear from you, Dr. Uh, John Bakoro. The uh, Abazoda and interim government dismissed as baseless the statement or reports by the Human Rights Watch, which indicts non state armed groups for committing gross human rights violation. Just like uh, Dr. Gabila said, it, it becomes like a knife for an eye when the separatists are indicted. The Cameroon government, on the other hand, are happy when uh, the government is indicted. 
the separatists of course are happy what do you make of this recent uh, report of the human rights watch just like i said the uh, ig in interim government has dismissed as baseless but of course we understand that this has been going on what do you make of the report first of all must begin by noting that uh, I will be one of the very last persons to stand to defend anyone who is involved in wrongdoing against the citizens of our country. That is absolutely wrong. Taking life, uh, I mean, just baselessly is of no use. That is the barrack. And uh, I will obviously condemn such actions. I mean, I don't care whoever carries out such actions, I will condemn them. But again, you begin by asking yourself, why, how did we first of all get here? Why did we get here? We shouldn't have been here if at all things were done right. I am a member and leader of the consortium. We birthed this movement back home in 2016 in all peace. I mean peace. We carried only peace plans all over the place. We moved from office to office at times even begging to be listened to. At the end of the day, government said, okay, we will sit down for dialogue. While we settled down for dialogue, suddenly this same government got up and decided to use a high hand that we all saw. If you will recall, we led several campaigns whenever we were calling on people to go to the streets to express their inalienable right to demonstrate, to show that they were not happy with what was happening. And we always campaign and ask them, make sure you don't carry even stones. We said even giant rubber guns don't carry. We always make sure we tell people don't carry even sticks, no matter what. And the people respected and obeyed us in this light. They did all of this. And you will recall that even the most giant of all the demonstrations on September 22, 2017, that saw millions of Southern Cameroonians on the streets including grandmothers, including grandfathers, babies, the lame, and I mean, people in all shapes, they all had peace plans in their hands. How did we get to the point where people have to start using weapons against one another? It was the government of Cameroon that decided to fall on people with a high hand, burn people alive in their houses, kill even babies. And now when people get up that they want to defend themselves, you know what happens. Any kind of Tom, Dick, or Harry will jump into the whole thing and take advantage. This is why, from day one, right up to the end of this conflict, I will lay responsibility for every single atrocity squarely on the shoulders of the government of Cameroon. Because we didn't have to get it in the first place. We absolutely did not have to. That's number one. Number two... While I listen to my brother, Mr. Uh, Nick Santos, with rapt attention as he narrated how he was misguided, he was misled, I start asking myself if the PhD he really has was that which could allow him to simply be easily misguided and misled like that, just from nowhere until the point where he did not just join the movement, he operated in the upper rungs of this particular movement and was part of a giant scheme of manipulation. Look, sometimes we should be honest enough to own up to the things that we do, to own up to our actions. It's not always fine that when you suddenly, because when you break around, because you have, when, when, when people break around, you go, you say, okay, I did this, and then you've earned some money from it, turn your best, and then you suddenly come and start demonizing people whom you called comrades yesterday. Me, I look at that and I say, it it, um, um, uh, I mean, it, it defines the kind of character that incarnates whoever is concerned. I don't have anything to say, but we know the kind of places that are reserved in the communities for people who flip-flop. Because I will not be surprised that tomorrow, the same Dr. Nick Nguyen stands again to say that the BR system deceived him and starts calling names of people that did so. So he's on a journey that will definitely continue. And that is why I respect my brother Kedia. Because Mr. Kedia has his point. He has been on that point forever. He has told himself, I will not stand with my people with the aspirations that my people have for freedom. I prefer to stand on the side of the oppressor 
and he has been consistent in that. And for that reason, I respect him. And that's why I want to go back to this to say, when the people of Rwanda went back from the diaspora to their country, they were not going back to certain death. It is not death that was calling them back. They were going back because when Mr. Kagame took over, he created an enabling environment. He created a society where the rule of law reigns. He created a place where people could blossom. He put in place institutions that will receive and give the opportunity for people to make their talents to benefit the community. That is why people returned. I, for one, I had never dreamed of living in the diaspora. Never. It never occurred to me that I'll find myself living in the diaspora. If you are asking people, be them from La Republic du Cameroon or from the Southern Cameroons, to go back to that country, ask them what they will tell you that they are going for. Some of you fought so hard against the U.S. extending the temporary protected status to people from the Cameroons. But of course, I could understand. But again, why did they grant? Because the United States government followed through on its promise and deported a first batch of Cameroonians back to that country. And to this date, some of those who were deported are missing. The family cannot account for them. So anyone who hears this, who listens to this, who knows this, will get up someday and carry themselves that I'm heading to Cameroon because I want to go there, like Keja says, to go and fight and die and be killed because it is in, in being killed. That will be called suicide. If you want to build, you will not commit suicide. You will use everything that you have from the fringes to, in, to you know, inject that change so that at least, even if in the process you finally die without having the opportunity to enjoy that change, Others who come after you will have the possibility to enjoy that change. And I'm so happy for my brother, Dr. Nick Santos, who is excited that he has moved from one group of people he calls barbaric, who don't have respect for life and all or not, to join another group of people who simply <laughs> suck the blood. Because when I look at what happened in Boya with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Moja Moja, who took somebody's child, and is lacerating that child with the machete on, on, I mean, on motion television. And that is a comrade to, to, to Dr. Nick Santos. Then I wonder whether you will not be reversing sides again very soon. So my brothers and sisters, I want to say this, and I want to be very, very clear and categorical about it. No one enjoys when any human being is being tortured. I will always and very quickly condemn any acts that are perpetrated against civilians by whomever. But again, don't forget, we have people who are Mr. Kedia's friends. And I've always not been too shy in calling their names. They are Tanganjis, the Fukalitus Gentries, the Fu Jonathans, who have trained boys and shipped them into the southern Cameroons with the sole intention of perpetrating as much evil as they can, exacting all kinds of torture on our people so that at the end of the day, Human Rights Watch will be able to pick that up. Of course, these are non-state actors. These are not Cameroon soldiers. So easily, they're amber boys. So therefore, these are the amber boys committing all of these acts. Oh, international community describe Ambazonians as terrorists. These people forget that they are actually happening on their own people on their very people, the very people that they are seeking or claiming that they are standing for. And this is a very despicable situation. But again, there are also armed robbers who are taking advantage of the chaos. Of course, uh, uh, Dr. Gabila said that a while ago. Armed robbers, people who have been armed robbers for a long time, have moved from the other regions where they could easily be apprehended into the area where they know that here, there's generalized chaos, and I can also pose as an amber boy and do anything I can do. But I'm not pretending here to say that there, is, that there are not really freedom fighters who get misled into committing exactions which are unacceptable. And all of these are things that we generally and naturally do condemn. The government of Cameroon is that rope system that will always 
want this kind of blame game to be in place because it gives them the opportunity to think and dream that they can hold us in bondage forever. We have demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt and sometimes even against good reason that we want to have peace, that we want to talk peace, that we want to have the opportunity to settle this thing politically on a negotiation table. My friends, even went to Switzerland, even when they, they were told and they knew and they, and, they, and they eventually discovered that La République du Cameroon will never commit to anything and that they would rather use that as a decoy. But they still went in simply because of that thirst that we have had. Southern Cameroonians are people who are peace lovers. This is clearly demonstrated in history. We never joined La République du, du, du Cameroon as an act of war. No. It was no war. They will never keep us by force. And this is the message I want to tell all those who, who sit and dream and think that Ambazonia is a pipe dream. No. Ambazonia is as real as life and death. Trust me on that. As real as life and death. People had episodes saying this kind of trash concerning Eritrea. You can tell me exactly where Eritrea is. People told me this trash concerning East Timor. You can tell me where East Timor is. Look, I want to let this be very clear to each and every one. Self-determination is a right. I'm a scholar of international relations. And I will tell you that even at the International Relations Institute in Cameroon, they recognize that the people of the Southern Cameroons are a people under international law, deserving of the right to self-determination. If there are some among us who feel, okay, we don't want this, we have always asked the, the, the international community, the United Nations, is it difficult for you to come and conduct a referendum? Ask our people what they want. By day and by night, they show it because we are tired. A scorch earth policy being conducted on our people. Just tell me this, uh, 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 Louis. You just hear one morning the Minister of, uh, uh, of Defense say, We are sorry, our soldiers went to Wum. And uh, I mean, in, 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 in Menchum, and out of fright and whatsoever, they decimated 13 people just like that. I mean, just like that. It is unacceptable. This is not anything anyone will want to go with. So, what I want to assure you is note that we talk to all those who, who manage or who have uh, fighters on the ground. On a daily basis, we have sensitization meetings with them and urge them to make sure they educate those that are carrying arms on the notions of humanitarian and international human rights law when it comes to the management of conflicts. And I think progressively, a lot of these non-armed actors are applying this. We have seen them get to villages, get to areas, and tell the people, the military are coming here tomorrow, please stay indoors. We don't want you outside so that there will be no collateral uh, you know, lives lost. We want to face the, the military. That's professionalism. We have seen that. We have seen that even when these guys go out to carry out uh, uh, attacks on military positions, they want the people in the localities. We have noticed that when incidentally someone falls as a result, they remind the people in the localities always be, be weary of being in the line of fire. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John Bakuru. Uh, let me hear from you, Engineer Elvis. We look at the response of uh, 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 the IG, the interim government, saying that the report presented by the Human Rights Watch is baseless. How do you think this is affecting the whole situation? Does it mean the uh, leaders of the non state armed groups are encouraging their fighters? Uh, to commit these atrocities because we realize that in the reports presented by the Human Rights Watch they emphasize that leaders of this non state armed group should uh, caution their fighters not to commit these atrocities so, and to equally hold them to account and to bring them forward for prosecution in case they committed these atrocities but then the uh, IG responded by saying the report is baseless and is sponsored possibly uh, by a Western power. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I don't think that by saying that the report is baseless, 
they were actually out to encourage their fighters um, uh, to go committing atrocities against um, uh, the communities. On the contrary, I think, like they themselves rightly said in their report, that the idea is that they want the international community to rather understand that it may be a sponsored something. That is their opinion. That's what they think. It may be a sponsored something to tarnish the image of um, uh, uh, the Ambazonian fighters. You know, like uh, many have said, and just like um, uh, John Bach was saying a few minutes ago, many of them, of the artists of the, the Ambazonians, they, they, they think and they insist on the fact that um, uh, not only we have armed bandits who have taken over uh, a, a, a advantage of the city, which we know is true, but we also, they, they also insist on the fact that some of these boys are even created by some government officials, you see, to exact this um, atrocities and then at the end of the day they are labeled on the, the, the uh, ambassador fighters. So I think by so doing they are not trying to encourage their people, but they just maybe want human rights and the uh, international community to be more vigilant and in carrying out their investigations and then reporting what they are seeing. But on my own part, I would rather tell you, Mr. Bidben, that my what, what I rather think is the concern here is not um, uh, the report from human rights or the fact that um, uh, the IG dismissed it as being baseless. What I rather tell you is that, to me, atrocities have been committed by both parties involved in this war. Be they the, um, the, 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 the Republican Army or the uh, Ambassador Fighters, they have both committed atrocities. That is something we cannot deny. So I think what is, 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 we should be more concerned with as of now is how to get out of this situation. Uh, I will just make a remark. You know, my brother, uh, Mr. Kedia, he, he, he spoke so much with the, during the first uh, topic about um, criticism, criticism, and all because to him, he believes in his regime, or uh, in the RCP, they believe that when you criticize, it is because you are an enemy of the state. But he made something, he made a statement which is very important. We should propose solutions and look for the way forward. But in all the minutes he's, he took to talk, I did not see him propose any one idea as to the way forward. On the contrary, he emphasized so much on sanctions against um, Morocco, which I agree with him on that. If a nation violates human rights, they should be sanctioned. Now, I want to think and hope that he will also insist that the regime that he defends so much should also be sanctioned severely too because the human rights violations we are talking about here in the Northwest and the Southwest, we know very well this regime is also fully implicated in this rights violation. I hope he will also use the same tone too in reminding us of the fact that when you violate such rights, you need to be sanctioned because I must remind here that when we are talking about human rights violation here, that Cameroon as a state is a more a contracting partner or a, yes, a contracting state party to at least seven international and uh, uh, regional human rights um, law instruments without counting the four uh, Geneva Conventions plus the additional two um, uh, 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 conventions, you see. So it means, therefore, that at the end of the day, whether you are of the armed fighters or you are uh, of, of, of this regime or the, the, the military, exacting actions against the people of the former British Southern Cameroons, at the end of the day, there will be a need for people to be held accountable for what is happening back then. Secondly, uh, Dr. Nick uh, also says something which is very, very important. And it, 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 it baffles me that he was with the CPDM, left the CPDM, and joined a group of people that he today qualifies in his own terms, and then discovered how bad they were, and then he went back to the same CPDM, the same CPDM, the same regime that we know is responsible for what is happening. And he says in his own words that what we had as a genuine case, the Amazon crisis, which is genuine and legal, that it is as a consequence of an inadequate mismanagement of the situation that things went out of hands. But I'm baffled that he left the CPDM, went to the IG, and came back to the same CPDM again, which has been unable to adequately handle the situation. So my concern now is, what is he doing? He says his voice is now better heard within the same CPDM. Why happened that his voice was not heard before when he was there? That he thinks it will only be better heard at this particular point in time. Now that he's back into it, what is he doing? To ensure, therefore, that the crisis back in that part of the country comes to an end. And I want to ask him just one question before I continue, Mr. Bibben. Does he not think, because in my opinion, being the, 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 the psychoanalyst that he is, perhaps he should have been better off back in the country at this particular point in time. At the DDR centers, maybe trying to talk to the boys there or convincing those on ground who carry guns to be able to drop his gun. But I think with his caliber and profession, that is a job that he could quite uh, size into to be able to do it. Convince these boys to maybe drop their arms and also talk to his uh, to, 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 to members of his party to see 
reason to understand that this issue is a political issue and will only be handled politically and not through the barrel of the gun. But ironically, he's in the U.S., but he fails to understand one thing, that in as much as he may tell us that he abandoned the IG members who are scammers and all whatnot, but that today they know him we are living in this country today. It doesn't count to the fact that he is one of those who ignited it and that though he has resigned from the IG, as he says, the mayhem continues, the civilians continue to pay the price back here in the country, but he's comfortable in the U.S. I would have loved that he comes back here and he puts his psychoanalyst, uh, 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 how do I his professional skills into use back to go. We need people like him at this particular point in the country to ensure that peace returns. This government needs psychoanalysts to talk to them, to let them see reason and understand that dialogue is what we need. The boys in the GTR are the center and those still carrying guns. Those in Nigeria, those who have whose hands have been chopped off and all these people need psychoanalysts today to talk to them and be able to let them have a different a, a change of the present mind uh, a frame of mind that they have so that peace can return back into this country so mr b ben i want to think like i've said already my greatest concern here is not the fact that the human rights commission or, or human rights watch wrote what they wrote my greatest concern is not the fact that the ig dismiss it my greatest concern is that whether we accept it or not both belligerents have been committing atrocities but it is ironical and unfortunate that the state will commit atrocities claiming that they are protecting civilians and protecting national integrity. The Ambazonians will commit atrocities claiming, claiming that they are protecting their own people and defending a territory. And at the end of the day, the, 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 the civilians turn out to be the sole victims. And come to think of it, if you go back into the same report, it says something that has been baffling me. That from January to this present moment of 2022, that the Ambazonian fighters killed, I think, eight um, uh, 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 civilians, if my memory doesn't fail me, from the report of, of, of human rights. But we know, for instance, that in just one village, or in, in just one that I can mention, for instance, they will tell that they immediately killed, at the, I think, between 9 to 13 in, in just one day. So at the end of the day, you, you may have the impression, we are tempted to have the feeling that at one point in time, the civilian casualties are even more in the hands of the professional military that has been uh, uh, provided to us. So, I still want to stay here, Mr. Bidben. Dr. Nubon said something important. The people first. And I think that's the way to go. If we can consider that whatever thing we do, we are doing it for the people first, then I want to think that the Republican military, I want to think that the regime in this country, I want to think that the Ambazonian fighters, they will reconsider their stance and strategies and consider the path of dialogue because that is the only way that can lead us out of this mayhem and of course bring out back some sanity into our communities and be able to spare our people of the hardship that they are now undergoing. I live back here in Yaoundé, but believe in me, living back here in Yaoundé is it doesn't mean that I am comfortable. You cannot imagine that from 2016 to today, I can barely step my legs back in my own village in Oku to find out how my own relatives are doing back there. I am not here because I enjoy just being back here. I can tell you that being back here, we still spend the little that we don't even have trying to cater for people who have displaced themselves from the region and they are back here struggling. You see children today who can never go to school. Either they do something of hugging in the streets or they are trying to go through evening schools and all not. I think that these belligerents should be able to rethink their strategies. If they both claim that they are fighting for the best interest of the people, they should consider the part of dialogue and commit to dialogue. And when I talk about committing to dialogue here, again, I still want to say that the regime in this country has uh, uh, is, is to be held more responsible than the Ambassador fighters because they hold to me the yam and the knife in this whole situation. They have not made their environment and enabling one for people to feel like they can trust the government. There is no trust when they, as far as the regime is concerned. I said something in the first half of this program that when you take our leaders in this country, if you take the head of state, I still say it again. Can you cite any instance where he has for the past six years today? address a message to the people of the former British Southern Cameroon that could at least console them and give them the impression that at least for once their president has spoken and they could want to consider to listen to him and maybe for those who have been radicalized reconsider their stance on it I say no when his ministers go on air and they talk you hear the way they talk when other spokespersons in this country have the opportunity to talk it is all about arrogance 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 and some will go as far as reminding you that even if it has to take 50 years they will give you guys there that is the language 
that cannot encourage people to want to go for dialogue. So people need to reconsider their language. People need to reconsider their stance as far as this crisis is concerned. But understand most importantly that while we commend peace, while we commend the path to dialogue, we must understand that the people come first in all what we do. I said in the first part of the program, and I will repeat, no matter what we say or do here today, we are not necessarily doing it for ourselves. We are doing it for posterity. We are doing it for future generations to come. We should leave a country that when our children in the years, in, 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 in years to come will take over, they will be able to recall that at least we stood on the right part of history and at least we gave our little contributions to be able to transform the nation and make it a better place. We can easily talk to you and recite Rwanda and Paul Kagame. Good and fine. It's good for Africa. But the truth is that Paul Kagame, at least, like John Bakru was saying, he is making the environment and enabling one first that can even permit the people in the diaspora to want to come back home. How many Cameroonians today, be they from the British Southern Cameroon, be they in from French Cameroon, who are actually on exile, can just get up one morning and feel like, let me just change my mind and go back to Cameroon? I don't think there is any of them. Not because they are very, very comfortable stay out there, not because they don't like the country, but because the regime in place is, has failed to enable the people gain any iota of confidence in them. The regime in place has failed to enable the people have some trust in them and see and feel that they are committed at least for once to be able to allow people express their political views. When, you, when I listen to my brother Kedia, for instance, he mentioned something about um, uh, we should not say things that we cannot defend in the law court. That is the problem here. Where people always think that if you disagree and you express your viewpoint that doesn't go in line with theirs, then they want to start by threatening you with the idea of the law court. No. We should be able to allow people to express their views. We may not agree on certain things. It doesn't mean you're an enemy to you. And I do not think that because I criticize you, it means I hate this country. Let the citizen regime in this country understand for once that they are not more patriotic than any other Cameroonian. Let them understand for once that they are not more patriotic even than those today who have arms in their hands. They are not more patriotic than those who are in the diaspora and cannot step out their lives in this country and spend time criticizing the country. On the contrary, those who carry arms today, they still carry with them the, the national ID card in this country. They still carry with them the passports of this country. And one of the reasons why for the heart to pick arms, so let me say it, you may not agree with me, but it is because of the love they have for this country. It got to a point where they could no longer bear again with their intolerance from the regime, with the bad governance and all of the fact that people will want to express themselves and you will prefer and you will think that the only way you can accommodate them is by using violence. Uh, remember that with the Anglophone crisis, for instance, if you go out to the members of the consortium, I want to take the Abobala, for instance, what took them to jail? The simple fact that they expressed their political views and they stood for what? For a federal system, it was not suppression. We should be very careful about the things we say. But they were stuck terrorists and they ended behind bars. If I want to take someone, for instance, like um, the, the, my former national president, Chief, Chief Justice Ayapol, he spent almost 10 months behind bars. See, today nobody has ever officially told him exactly why he was behind bars. These are the things we are saying about the regime in place. They must reconsider their stance and their way of doing things. We cannot be claimed to be a, a, a state of law and then those in power think that the law must be tailored to suit just their interests such that if you go against or if your views go against their own views, automatically you are the enemy in the state and you are the one to pay the price. No, there are people in this country that if we go actually by law, right in the regime in itself, many of them will not be free citizens. So we should understand that people do not necessarily criticize God, they hate the country. On the contrary, it is because we are fed up, it is because we are embittered by the fact that the regime has been there for 40 years, and I may even say 60 because it is a continuation from uh, late President Amado Ayijo, but they have not been able to enable Cameroonians feel, or all Cameroonians feel like they actually do belong. Thank you. Thank you, Gine. Elvis, uh, now Robert Kedia, several shots, of course, have been fired at you. And uh, considering the Human Rights Report, which indicts separatists uh, for gross human rights violation, the Cameroon government seems satisfied. The government dominated by the ruling CPJ party, uh, to which you are a member, seems satisfied with this present report by the Human Rights Watch. But when the report indicts them, we equally see them dismissing it just like the uh interim government of the separatist uh, leadership has equally dismissed as baseless now how satisfied of course is the government based on the fact that the separatists are now indicted by the human rights watch
um, the Human Rights Watch have come out with their outing, and I believe that uh, since this crisis started, we've been seeing their outing that are, they have been coming out. And uh, I'm so sad, I'm so sad that my co-panelists, which I know them very well, all of them, nobody came out to say the Human Rights Watch is correct. I've had many programs with John Bakuru based on outing of the Human Rights Watch, which he will say the Human Rights Watch is absolutely correct. But today, he was not able to say they are correct. Same with the co-panelists in South Africa and same with the co-panelists in Yaoundé. The outing has come out and uh, it's sad that John Bakuru will be bringing up excuses to say that there are some people in the government that have hired guys. It's so sad. I don't even want to go into that. I don't want to go into such ping pong. Our people are dying. Should we be involved in ping pong? That you say this, I come here, I defend this, we start to argue about ourselves. Is this what we should be doing after six years? Are we crazy? Are we mad? That we should come here, you start insulting each other, this government is useless, that one is this, this one. Is that what we should be doing now? And we say we love our people back home. Are we actually hypocritic? That government is absolutely useless. Please. 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 It is not from me that you want to hear that Eric Tato says hands of children should be chopped off. It's not from me. Everybody knows such violations. We all know all these aspects. Or should I be the one that should come and tell you that separately say there should not be no schools? Or you don't know that school has to do with school education is a fundamental human right? And I should be the one to tell you that separately say there should be no schools? And that is violation of human rights? I should be the one to say this? Or you people are ignorant, you don't know that separatists came out and said there will be no schools? We all know this. But i like us to concentrate on the way forward. And uh, for the way forward, we should be able to diagnose the problem. And when diagnosing the problem, we should be very honest. We are faced now with three problems. We have separation. We have Anglophone problem and we have Anglophone crisis. Before the coming of the white man, we were a nation, we, live, we were living together. Germany came, took us, we left, to get, we left with Germany as a colony, and due to the war, we were partitioned. And later on, we came back together. After the Eastern Regional Crisis of Nigeria in 1953, we had those that wanted us to remain with Nigeria like Endele, we, wanted, we had those that wanted us to join La Republic du Cameroon, like Foncha Esimuna. We had Bile that wanted us to be independent as a nation. As time went forward, within the 1956, 57, 58, he did not have a majority support after the Murphy, various Murphy Conference and the London Conference. And in 1960, Bile decided to join Foncha, and there was an election and our people decided to join La Republic du Cameroon. However, there, is, there was a minority of those that had the view of NNBLA that we should be a nation. And that ideology has grown up to become today what we call the separatists. We also have the Anglophone problem. The genesis of the Anglophone problem could be seen back in the 1961 uh, Fumban Conference where the, uh, the constitution was put in place and uh, that all language should be equal. Uh, in the very constitution, it was actually said the system should be federalism and, should, and many other aspects, which there are some people that believe that it has been violated and uh, they want to go back to it. That's the Anglophone problem. And we have the Anglophone crisis that started, I think, in 2016 with the outburst of the issue of the teachers and the, the lawyer. And to bring out solution, any of this problem actually have uh, their own solution. But uh, the most important one of them we have been talking about is dialogue. And all of them, all of you in the diaspora that are part of this program and that are watching, 
you know that dialogue started with you people abroad when ministers were sent to South Africa, to Europe, and the rest. And you people in the diaspora told the ministers that go back and discuss with our people. And the government came back and discussed with the people with the Grand National Dialogue. And up to now, dialogue is ongoing. And we have hope that as dialogue are ongoing, we will come back and there will be lasting peace in our nation. We should give our own quarter. We should be able to come out and give our own participation so that we should build uh, uh, our nation. I will not come here to start talking about John Bakul saying that uh, the Anglophone went to uh, 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 Switzerland because they wanted to talk because they loved their nation. But John Bakuru, as hypocritical, he did not say that the people that went to Switzerland were going for 5,000 euros. And he knows it. We want to build our nation. We don't say the truth. But when I say the truth, it will be that CPDM. He's eating from the crumbs. When you say they went to Swiss because they loved their nation and they were going there for dialogue, and you don't tell the people that before they went there, they asked for 5,000 euros. That's millions. They wanted money. Greed. You don't tell them that. But you say they went there because they loved their money. They, they love their nation, but they went there for 5,000 euros. There are many of these aspects. I will not come here to start naming what the government have done. Shall I start? 2000, uh, all teachers that are francophone have been brought back. Magistrates, same. Even all deals, all administrators now, 80% of them are anglophone. That's even why when they got the regional delegate of plain protection, they thought it was uh, a francophone, but they are all anglophones, all the SGO deals. 80% of them are anglophone. Everything has been adjusted back. We should work together to build this nation. We should not, we should even stop talking about international uh, whatsoever. Sorry, those people have their interests now. We know this now. So we should stop saying that the international uh, organizations should intervene, all those songs. We have been singing about that for five years. Even when the diaspora deceive our people back home that they should not go to school, the UN will intervene. You told them that they are sending United Nations forces since five, how many years today? We should stop all that. The way forward. And with the way forward, as I said, I would not like to go into ping pong and start to argue. The way forward is that us Anglophones, we need to come together. I appreciate elites of the Southwest region. I appreciate elites in Yaoundé and abroad of the Southwest region, they are putting a lot of effort. And someone like me, on my own part as a youth, I'm struggling to see how to create the Northwest Youth League on how we could come together, talk with the young uh, parliamentarians of the Northwest, assemble all of them together, work with the regional presidents so that we can create a body, a team of youth how we could stand on behalf of the youth. I appreciate what we feel Melo Change is doing with regards to women tax force so that we bring women together so that we can, uh, they can be together and they have their own view as women. We remember in, uh, I think, Sierra Leone, women were those that stood up together, stood for uh, sex starvation to their husband and the men were forced to come and sit together and bring solution. So at that aspect, I'm trying to bring youths together so that we can work with the institution and we can talk with our brother in the bushes to be able to drop uh, their arms. The part of them holding arms in this modern time is just there to create more havoc. I was happy with my co-panelist from South Africa when he was talking and I was loving. Yes, I was loving because you said it is time for a citizen from DOP. Where I come from? To discover nuclear weapon, discover drugs for HIV, and many other discovery, as you were saying. That's why I was happy, because I come from there, and that's what I wish for the Cameroonian people. That's what I wish for my nation. And I will do my own possible best to ensure that people come together to bring lasting solution. I was very bitter, Mr. Lewis, when uh, the, the president of the regional house of the Northwest region wanted to make a tour. I don't know what actually happened, if there was shortage of resources, but those are the things I promote. However, I appreciate all my co-panelists for airing their mind and seeing what they feel. And I think that if that opportunity should be given to all uh, Cameroonians of Northwest and Southwest to express their mind, that would be a very good step for 
uh, to wash away the, so the depression that is going on in the mind of people as people talk with anger or whatever. But to conclude and to end here, I would say we should give peace a chance. We should give peace a chance. Justice will come later, but now let us give peace a chance. We can fight anything we want diplomatically, but please, not through war. A single life is important. Clearly. Uh, Dr. Nick Santos, uh, several shots were fired at you, and uh, just like uh, your colleague from the CPCM said, he's suggesting that it's time for solutions, and why others are equally uh, suggesting that you possibly could come back home with a rich knowledge in psychology to better uh, work towards resolving the crisis, and someone said uh, maybe the DDR Center needs people who can talk them out of the crisis or talk them to maybe lay down their arms and uh, maybe you have other comments regarding the shots which were fired at you Dr. Nick Santos for giving me the opportunity to address the shots that were coming to me from three directions um, first to begin I want to remind Mr. John ba Akuru, that I didn't join the separatists when it was an armed conflict. I didn't join the separatists when it was an armed conflict. I joined in, in agitating the marginalization of Anglophones and at the early phase of it, during when Seseko Julius Ayoktabe came and made me the spokesperson during my psychoanalysis, he was basically using peace plans at that time. Peace plans. Before the guns were bought and purchased, I was not, I mean, before the guns were bought and purchased, I had resigned from the IG in 2018. I want to remind Mr. John Bakoro, I didn't join kidnappers, rapists, thieves, and daydreamers, haters and killers, abductors who will pass death sentences in bedrooms on videos abroad. I didn't join that. Even in the CPDM, I do not condone with those who perpetrate violence. I am moving on the path of being a reformer. I understand how painful you on the other side may feel leaving you guys, which is the move I made since 2018-19 by resigning from the IG group. Um, I stayed quiet for a while, then decided that the only way to offer my contribution to nation building is through a political party, and one in which I already have a track record. I'm sorry, Mr. John Bakuro. I'm a doctor that treats patients suffering from delusion and hallucination, and won't ever be a patient in my own department. I didn't hear you address the passing of death sentences on Madame Regina Mundi in the bedrooms abroad. I didn't hear you talk about the burning of hospitals, the cutting of limbs and hands. Mark you that by me criticizing the armed robbers doesn't mean I do not as well criticize the high-handedness of the military. In this particular, in my contribution process to nation building, I first of all take into consideration my role as a doctor, my role as one who has sworn a doctor hypocritical oath is one that I consider the members on the government side who are perpetrating the violence to be my patients and the armed separatists to also be my patients and to deny psychoanalyzing them, diagnosing them and giving recommendations or formulating a treatment planning for them means I have denied services to my patients. So sometimes do not carry me and go and lock me in a box somewhere. You don't know the good work I have been doing. To begin with, I will tell all viewers and all Cameroonians listening and Africans that it was thanks to me and me alone within the Transitional Restoration Council at the time that I was the only member in the IG that went and met the delegation from La Republic to Cameroon that came here for the Grand National Dialogue. And it was a window and presented paperwork from all your so-called internet leaders 
and these paperwork were taken into consideration and studied. That's how we had a special status. No matter that we could be criticized, <laughs> the status, it was the beginning uh... of something. Regionalism is the beginning of something. You may ask your father 100,000. He gives you 25,000 or 30,000. It doesn't mean that there is not something that has started to come out. Then, one of the witnesses is that most of us talking have never even sat down to examine what came out of that dialogue because we consider that everything that came out of it is totally bad. Sometimes it's good to recognize the little drop of something that comes out and give contribution towards working, towards building it to have what you want. For example, I have not only been talking and talking, I'm the founder of the Peace Task Force Initiative. I'm the founder of the Peace Patriots. You must have heard about that. And these are these are projects in which we have been able to send proposals both to the government and the separatists on how to resolve this conflict. You've heard about the Ghana Peace Conference that you, Mr. John Bakoro, distracted us by taking us to Canada. You condemned it and criticized it that nothing will come out of Ghana and you went and was working towards the other one in, in Canada, and you took us along with you, and we work in the Peace and Humanitarian Commission of what happened in Canada. Would that you spearheaded? You know, I've always been against the, the Swiss peace. I told you people, oh, it's a scam. And none of you believed it. And really, it is. So the point is, I don't want to be following a group of people who are hallucinating or de being delusional because those are my patients, and that's what I treat. So I have recommended in a lot of write-ups to the Cameroon government and to my people on the ground how we can resolve this problem. To resolve this problem is simple. From a medical perspective, you know that to treat a bacteria, you use a higher dose of the bacteria, work on it in a laboratory, inject it on the human being to chase that bacteria that is inside the system. I came into the CPDM with a reason that I will be a reformer from within. And you don't know the work I've been doing from within, which you may think that is only going to the television and making videos after videos that will help this situation. You're sensitizing the people, yes, but the issue is, are you talking to the people who are concerned, the people whose parents can make decisions? You are not. What I have done, I propose to them that to resolve this problem is, first of all, release some of the people who are in detention, or almost all the Anglophones in detention, so that those of the peace patriots and those ex-amber fighters and ex-amber leaders can work together with them to talk to the people. Because right now, the people have lost trust in most of the people that are sent on the ground. That's why there's a deadlock. So some of us have begun working with some of these people in the jails and and, and some of the fighters in the bush to talk to them and as well as the government on how we can resolve this issue. You must have heard of the programs that we have developed like rehabilitation, restoration, repentance, restructuring, rebuilding, recognition. If the, 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 the ball is not only in the court of the government, the ball is also in your court and the ball is right here in this room. If we are seated here, six of us, anglophones, six of us from Southern Cameroon, if we cannot agree and propose a way forward on how to resolve this problem, we keep on pointing fingers on one another. Dr. Nick did this, Dr. Nick did not do this. You, you don't look at what Dr. Nick is doing within the CPGM and within the structure as a psychoanalyst, as a psychologist, to propose a, a roadmap to peace by founding the Peace Task Force Initiative, by founding the Peace Patriots, and by telling the government as it is without supporting those who are causing the problem on the government side and without supporting those who are causing the problem on the separatist side. Because all of these people are my patients. I'm glad, as you mentioned, that the DDR needs me, uh, rehabilitation needs me, I need to do a lot of work. Let me tell you, when you talk about rehabilitation, this is what I've always spoken about. Rehabilitation is a process that has to be removed, or a program that has to be removed from territorial administration and from corrections and put under health. Because rehabilitation means
Uh, Dr. Nick Santo, we sorry for that, but uh, certainly we got you clearly. Let's hear from you, uh, Dr. Uh, Gabila. Uh, we have two minutes for your proposed solutions. We uh, understand that we're looking at way out of the crisis at this point in time. There's been blamed even from those watching, like the Human Rights Watch, train blames left and right, but then it's not helping in resolving the crisis. What could possibly be the way out at this point in time? Thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I, I think we need to all agree that we are dealing with a political problem that has a historical origin. And because it's a political problem, it requires a political solution. So in terms of a way forward, I think that it's, it's one of two things. Firstly, I think largely the onus is on the government of Cameroon to create a conducive environment for dialogue. A conducive environment for dialogue that's that constitutes in giving, uh, not giving assurances, but giving, sending out signals that says that they are willing to solve the problem. And when it comes to dialogue, I think there are three different kinds of dialogues that need to take place. There needs to be an all anglophone dialogue where the principal message is, let us give this a chance. The fact that we can, all of us sit in this room and differ in our opinions, but still have a conversation speaks to the the, the fundamental nature of ourselves as a people. The government of Cameroon needs to know that Anglophone psychology functions in such a way that it submits to superior logic. The government of Cameroon needs to know and must learn from the history of Cameroon and opposition politics and our experience for the last 30, 40, 50 odd years that the typical Southern Cameroonian does not back down at the threat of violence. That is what essentially distinguishes the culture of British colonization from the culture of French colonization. I want to be persuaded that my logic is wrong. I do not feel intimidated at the sight of a god. So, so the Cameroon government should understand the people they are dealing with and also come to terms with the fact that on the basis of that, it needs to be a logic. I am persuaded that within the message of giving peace a chance, there are people within the Anglophone community, the Southern Cameroonian community, if we are given a possibility of meeting with each other, I believe that we have fathers and mothers and institutions, traditional civil society and religious that are able to, with everybody in the room, can persuade people from across all tendencies. I believe I can sit and reason with, uh, with uh, John Bakuro and says, listen, Uncle John, let us give this thing an opportunity. I believe that that persuasion will come easier from Anglophones persuading Anglophones than from the government of Cameroon trying to use intimidation and force to bring that about. This is my personal conviction. That's why I feel that an all Anglophone conference or all Anglophone dialogue is an absolute necessity. The second dialogue that needs to happen is between the people of the former British Southern Cameroon and the government of Cameroon to revisit the terms of the reunification because that is the root cause of the problem. The whole notion that we joined this union on a certain understanding and 30, 40 years has evolved and things are not flowing as they have expected to be. That, I believe, was the basis of the foundation of the consortium. It has taken us six years of fighting. So many people have died, and we are still stick sticking on the same point. Now, peace that does not deal with the fundamental root causes of the conflict is just postponing the problem. It's kicking the can down the road, because another generation is going to rise at some point, at some stage, that is going to bring the same issues on the table. Now, there's no reason for us to have shed so much blood and have destroyed so many lives and destroyed the lives of so many people just to postpone the, the problem. We must deal with the root causes. This is what I consider to be an a dialogue between the people of the former British Southern Cameroon and the government of Cameroon on the terms of the, of, of the resolution, of, of, of the reunification. And the third dialogue should be an all-inclusive Cameroonian dialogue on the Vivre and Sun. You know, the whole notion of how do we stay together as a people. There are governance models out there that help to manage diversity. Tanzania and Zanzibar have come out with a formula where the president comes from Tanzania, the vice president must come from Zanzibar. There are enough examples around the world from which we can draw inspiration. The heart of this problem, Luis, as I conclude, it's a question of the devolution of power and resources, where the people of the former British Southern Cameroons want to be given the means and the resources to be able to manage their livelihood and come up with an arrangement where a government in put in is in place to manage the affairs of the state. But governance and resources should be devolved 
give off to the people so that we can hold accountable the people who are responsible for the food we eat and the water we drink and the roads we drive on and the hospitals we go to. We must elect them, give them a mandate, and then assess them and renew their mandate. You must devolve power and resources and governance to the people. And then come up with a formula that manages the nation and its relationship with the rest of the world on the basis of a, a formula that is acceptable, that is inclusive. But let's give peace a chance. Let's create conducive conditions for that by releasing the political prisoners, by encouraging our people to talk among ourselves. We can All right, thank you very much, Dr. Gabila. And uh, let's hear from you, John Bakoro. Sorry, we might just have to stick to two minutes for your conclusion. Uh, we understand that since the major national dialogue, uh, Prime Minister, in one of his outings, said that separatist leaders have most at times advanced personal interests when it comes to dialoguing with them. That the Cameroon government has a meeting, most of the separatist leaders, when most of them advance personal interests, just like. Uh, uh, someone said that uh, in the course of attending a dialogue, they requested to uh, be, be paid before they could attend uh, possibly a meeting. So what do you think regarding the fact that dialogue is what many are prescribing should work out? Just like Dr. Gabila said that we have to dialogue, there should be a dialogue there. How possible is this dialogue going to happen? Even considering the, the division that exists between the Ambazonian leadership, talks about division that has been a very sing song the Cameroon government itself is not united so they should stop making noise about division elsewhere when they themselves are intrinsically divided divided to the point where they don't transform their country into a powder magazine uh, i want to say this if uh, the prime minister of uh, la republic du cameroon the figurehead there he says that uh, you know he's meeting some separatist leaders or calls them separatist leaders or some leaders of our liberation movement and they are advancing personal interests. You should name them because we are quick at calling the names when we're talking about them in the Republic du Cameroon. I do that on a daily basis. If they met with me and I said that, uh, that uh, you know, I want you, I rather want to be prime minister in your place or I want financial benefits, say it. Stop playing about the bush. If you are talking about nation building, you'll not be playing around those kind of petty things. I know that uh, they have their pseudo people in their midst that they planted to try and cause some kind of confusion. But it's definitely not going to take them absolutely anywhere. And you know, it's laughable when I hear someone talk about special status. Who is giving who a special uh, a special status? <laughs> a country which is uh, which is which was the same class as the, the as the 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 southern Cameroon's as truck territory begins being the one giving. Or just say the word giving. Come on, you should be able to have some respect for the people of the southern Cameroons. And just I want to tell uh, Mr. Mr. Kedia. If you are reading history upside down, go and read your history perfectly. Listen, after the, uh, the, the referendum of February 11, 1961, the United Nations on April 21, 1961, held an independence vote for Southern Cameroons. Do you know why? Because the Southern Cameroons needed to be independent to negotiate a treaty of union with an already independent La Republic du Cameroon. Does that make sense to you? That should tell you we did not walk into the Union as, uh, you know, some kind of puppets that just came in to be kept somewhere. No. We achieved independence. I mean, the United Nations voted overwhelmingly. The Republic of Cameroon voted against the independence of the Southern Cameroons on April 21, 1961. After we had voted on February 11 to join them. Does that tell you that they already had the evil design that we are seeing today at the behest of France and all Francophone African countries with the exception of Mali. So you should bear that in mind when you are trying to truncate the history and try and confuse our people. And because we're an entity, because we're an independent state that moved in to get into a union treaty with another independent state, if we are not satisfied with the union, we can move out at any time. And we have decided that it is time to move out. The Republic of Cameroon can do anything they want to do with France. They can try as hard as they can. They will never hold us down. You know, the African Union cannot make a noise because uh, uh, Moussa Faki is a, is a French civil servant. That we are aware. You know, I want to tell you this. Put it at the back of your mind. There is never 
a scenario in the world where peace and reconciliation made sense in the absence of justice. It has never happened anywhere in the world. Dr. Gabila is in South Africa. He will tell you what happened there in South Africa. You begin by justice before you start talking about peace and reconciliation. Because what generated this problem is an issue of justice. Like Dr. Gabila pointed out, when we birthed, birthed this phase of, of our struggle, in 2016, we requested that to address the issues holistically within a one Cameroon, let's return to the federal system. And we were bashed and almost killed on to go to a point where we have said today, and this position, trust me, yes, is irreversible. The only solution today is a two-state solution. We will respect the people of the Republic of Cameroon as our neighbors. We will never, ever live together again as one people. We were never one. We will not be one again. And there is nothing that will keep us together with the bad people who will move in the community and burn alive all people who cannot run away from their homes. They, when they raise down the villages, all our villages in their minds, they think they can depopulate our land and transfer the people over there and try to see whatever they can do. But I want to assure you, and uh, you, Dr. Nick, uh, Dr. Nick Santos and uh, Kedia, I want to tell you, go back to history and read how the people of East Timor, who behaved like you within Indonesia, find out how they ended. Because at the end of the day, the oppressor never has a kind word for people who betray their people because they consider that since you betrayed your people, you will also betray them. Thank you very much, um, John Bakuru, President of Consortium. Uh, two minutes, uh, Mr. Gene Elvis, uh, National Communication Secretary for the Popular Action Party. What is the way forward at this point in time? Two minutes, please. What do you think can be done to resolve the crisis? We understand that many back then, the two regions, just like you say, are actually going through hardship, difficulty, and they are the ones who are being kidnapped, who are being raped, and who are being killed, and whose villages are being uh, burned, and you are not able to go back to your village. If you were to propose a solution like a politician or member of a political party in Cameroon, what would that be in two minutes? It has always insisted on the fact that we must give peace a chance. We must go back for, onto the dialogue table. In fact, we must, let me not say we must go back as if as though there has been dialogue before. We need to go onto the dialogue table. We often insisted on the fact that all southern Cameroonians who have been arbitrarily arrested with, in connection to the Anglophone crisis should be released. Because if you want peace to, re to, to return, you cannot be pretend to talk about dialogue when there are families back there where, who don't even know where their husbands or brothers or children are for three, four, five, six years. People who were arrested just because they come from that part of the country, but not because they have anything to do with the ongoing crisis. Let this people be released. Secondly, there is a need for us to be honest in whatever things we do. Dr. Uh, uh, Gabriel was talking about going back to the 1961 uh, 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 Constitution. That is something the PAP has always been insisting on. Let us revisit our history and go from there. I have often said that history is not a, 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 a piece of chalk writing on a board that you can just wipe with a duster and it goes off. No. The history has come to stay and we must refer ourselves back to the history because it is from there that certain things went wrong and we, are fi and we find ourselves where we are uh, today. Secondly, we say that we need to give people the opportunity to be able to express themselves. But I say the most important thing is not even just to give people the, 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 the arena to be able to express themselves, but that they should express themselves politically and be listened to too. That's another thing. Because at one point in time you talk and nobody listens to you, and that's the problem in this country. The Southern Cameroonians have been talking since 1961. Remember the AAC conferences, the AAC 1 and the AAC 2. People gathered themselves somewhere. They spoke. They came out with resolutions. They tabled their grievances. But the government in this country or the regime never paid any listening ear to them. So it is not just about giving people the room to talk to, but when they talk, you should also listen to them and ensure that you provide solutions to their grievances. Now, I am rather perplexed and baffled when I hear Dr. Lee mention the issue of the special status. Honestly, it makes me feel sick because I don't know who is who in this union to be offering a special status to who. He mentioned something of when you ask for something and a father gives you something, you should at least appreciate. Who is the father in this union? It will reconstitute that we went into the union as two equal parties and you are calling one person the father. So who is the father and who is the child? I am trying to beg 
The doctor, you, some of you should avoid trying to insult the people of the former British Southern Cameroons by giving the impression that we are somehow begging for something in this union. No, we went into the union as equals and we need to sit at the table as equal because that is the problem, one of the reasons why the crisis is persisting. Where some people think that they have an upper hand and so whatever thing that comes from them, the people of the Southern Cameroons must just accept it the way they give it. I say no to such a thing. We must sit around the table as equals and we discuss like it was before 1961 when we met in Fumba to discuss whatever thing that was discussed though we understand that La Republic was coming to the union already with a biased mind so my dear brother I will say and I will repeat again here there is a need for a genuine inclusive dialogue what happened in Yaoundé in 2019 was a monologue because some of the key perpetrators or let me say the, the promoters of um, the, 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 the 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 Ambazinian cause we are never part of the dialogue and we understand why they were not there because the regime has not given them the possibility to, to trust them for whatever reason. Let this regime be able to organize a genuine inclusive dialogue where all Cameroonians of all walks of life will sit together as a people and we share our views without anyone coming down with pre-prepared solutions thinking that he will just hand them over to the other party and you just accept them because in this union we came in as equals and we need to look at it from that perspective our people who are unjustly behind bars today should all be released let mr dear paul head of state he should be able to address the people of the southern cameroonians and i think that somewhere somehow if their government cannot apologize i am not asking them to apologize to ambassador fighters but i think they all the people, the, the civilians from the southern Cameroonians, they owe them a word of consolation, at least for what has been happening, for the for the for the suffering that they have undergone for the past six years. These are things we can. When we talk about peace, we talk about justice, we talk about reconciliation. Mr. Biden, please bear with me that you cannot achieve these things when the other person opposite to you, with whom you are supposed to dialogue, you keep seeing him a terrorist, you keep seeing him a separatist, you keep seeing him someone with whom you cannot talk. But at the same time, you want peace, you want justice, you want, um, uh, uh, I, I don't know, you, 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 I don't know. Uh, to achieve all these things, you must first of all learn to see in the other person a brother. We were brothers, we are brothers, we should learn to see and talk as a family round the table without anyone coming in to impose whatsoever on any other person. And let nobody's political views turn out tomorrow to be a reason for which his life will be threatened for whatsoever reason. If we sit down to talk, I should be able to air my mouth, my mind, and I go scot free of anything. I should not today insist on the fact that I want a federation, and the very next moment I become a terrorist and I have to find myself in jail because I mentioned the idea of a federation. Remember that anyway, Mr. Bia himself says the form of the state is non negotiable, and all the apologies of that region are hanging on that. Mr. Bia is head of state, yes. But this is supposed the form of the state is supposed to be decided by the people and not by a certain individual, not just because you hold the office of head of state. These are things that we have to understand and we go from those premises. Thank you very much. Genevisco, National Communication Secretary of the Popular Action Party. Thanks very much. Uh, we're ending with you, Mr. Robert Kedia. You had earlier mentioned that it's time for us to seek solutions, look at solutions, resolve the crisis. When you look at uh, what your government has been doing, the government has been doing, you said a lot has been done. Can you appreciate that there's been evolution, there's been changes, or any result has been achieved since 2019 when we first had the major national dialogue? Just two minutes before we conclude. Oh, oh, for sure, uh, with effective decentralization, the special status, the regional assembly that have been put in place, and uh, uh, now they are able to ensure that they can manage their judicial and educational system, which was one of the genesis of. Uh, the crisis and um, with the creation of DGRC Center which uh, those that are pick up arms will go there and uh, uh, drop their arms which is one of uh, a pipeline that have been put in place so that they can drop their arms and we keep on calling for dialogue for the entire uh, Anglophones of Northwest and Southwest we'll keep on dialoguing together and bringing out solutions to protect our country and our sovereignty and its integrity and we are doing this within the context of the constitution i appreciate uh, the national secretary of communication p uh, PAP? PAP, which, uh, yeah. yeah which we talked of uh, uh, going back to the 1961 uh, constitution federalism that's his view is within the constitution he has the right um, uh, the one from the panelists from south africa and uh, dr nick which for them they believe that uh, within the context of the constitution Cameroon is a sovereign state 
within that state you are ready you are free to propose what you want that's democracy your ideology is there you will never be arrested because you talk of confederation because you talk of federalism no it's your opinion we are in a democracy which your view is there but if someone comes again after this time with all what is happening and he's talking about the fact that one part should look at the other part as if uh, their neighbor or whatever sorry mr john Bakuru, those are outings of terrorists terrorism when you go against the constitution of the republic to say that the nation should separate it's an act of terrorism and the consequences will be there and if you don't stop that then you may likely come back into cameroon the way uh, some others in prison did came back so you should be very very careful with your utterances you say you have the right well, to say what yeah, you want, but within the, right the context and it's not a of the Constitution. It's not a uh, trait, to, yeah, to, Mr. To, to come now mm -hmm. to an end, uh, I would Mr. like to say that all of us in this country, not we have the right for our... No, that is, that is the approach with the, with the regime, with members of the regime. That is the approach. That's who they are. That is the approach with the regime. You don't come on TV and talk as a president. You don't come on TV and talk as a president. You have no right to say Cameroon will be a Separate you have no right to declare Cameroon a separate state. You do not have the right to declare Cameroon as a separate state. You need to condemn that. You don't declare independence yet. You don't do it yet. Team, where they think that when you do not agree with them, then they go by threatening. Go ahead and talk. I hope. We had more time so that we continue the debate, but my technician says we're already out of time. I want to appreciate all of your contribution on today's program. Robert Kedia, thanks very much, member of the CPDM. Thank you, Dr. Nick Santo. You are equally uh, who joined us from uh, the USA. Thanks very much for being there, Dr. Nick Santo. We equally had uh, Mr. Gene Elvis. Uh, that's, of course, we just appreciated you, a member of the Popular Action Party. We had... Uh, uh dr gabila thanks very much for being there and thank you very much john bakuro thanks very much for your time we hope to have you again some other time for more debates it's been wonderful equally thanks very much for watching those of you are back home and thanks to our technicians as well as well a rebroadcast will be yours on monday 14 hours gmt bye bye for now stay tuned more programs are yours on Africa media